All right, Dr. Rondeau Lamont, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned in, in sort of those opening comments, 5G is something that's really taking hold within the Department of Defense, and we've seen a lot of uh, pilots, experiments, use cases, tests going on over the last several years, and I know that a lot of that's been driven by your office, Dr. Rondeau, and uh, partnership with the services. So I'd love to hear, you know, a status update, if we could, about the, the you know, ongoing work around 5G and next G as it's being referred, because we're already looking at what comes after that and what the latest might be there. Yeah, or as we call it, future G. We're not even locking ourselves into just the next one. We're, we're trying to keep our sights on, on everything in the future. Uh, but yeah, so it's great to be here. Uh, and as you see, my title is the Principal Director for Future G and 5G. Uh, and I'd love to be able to talk a little bit about Future G at some point. Uh, but to, to get us there, right, we're, we're uh, working on some critical problems right now in 5G uh, and trying to create these pilots and get those pilots transitioned into the services. You heard Mr. Sherman talk about uh, how we're, we're transitioning a lot of our, our 5G efforts over to CIO in a few months. Uh, so they'll take over a lot of the capabilities and, and the practices we have here. So what we've done is uh, created a number of pilots uh, for dual use technologies and we've distributed them around the country at multiple different military installations. Uh, we're also working on some security aspects. Uh, how do we operate through this global information infrastructure that folks like Lamont and Verizon have been so gracious to, uh, to gift us with? Uh, and all the work that's gone behind that. So how do we take advantage of that in the DOD has, has been the question. Uh, so uh, the, note, the pilots that are running right now, all of them are executing. Or we've got test beds up and running, uh, looking at these applications. I'll focus on just one specific application because we're probably the most mature on that one today. And that's our smart warehouses. Uh, I've b recently visited uh, our one out in Naval Base Coronado and uh, Marine Corps Logistics Base uh, in Albany, Georgia. Uh, and we have taken lessons from industry, especially Industry 4.0, and automated and used those to automate our warehouse processing. And now this may sound not the most exciting or the sexiest thing that, uh, that we could be doing with this technology, uh, but logistics is so important to the, the waging and winning of wars that it is critical to the DOD. And we're really excited to be able to, to, to participate in this and, and lead on this one. Uh, so we've completely transformed how we think about the supply chain uh, logistics of getting, getting tracking and moving inventory around the world to solve critical military problems as we project our power uh, around the globe. Uh, so that one's been very successful and we're really looking forward to getting that transition and growing that capability throughout the services. Lamont, Dr. Rondeau gave you a nice shout out there and how Verizon's partnering in that, but tell us a little bit about the work that Verizon's doing to support that and some of the partnership uh, in how you're hoping to expand 5G across the Department of Defense. Yeah, no, thank you. So, yeah, we've been working a lot, uh, a lot with the, the different um, bases and stuff with uh, the Navy, with the Army, and trying to make sure that we are able to enable a lot of the applications and things like the smart warehousing, AR, VR training, all those types of things, and be able to get that real-time application um, and movement at the edge to make sure that the, the networks and um, the services are getting what they need to meet their missions. So a lot of what that takes is really building out that infrastructure, making sure that it's there, putting it and building it into um, the, um, the networks to make sure that you can see and test these things out, but realizing that how does this also integrate into some of the things while the, the DOD is going through a lot of their network transformation too as well. We're talking about trying to bring real-time applications, more analytics, more security onto some of these antiquated bases. And while the DOD is working through with us and others to try and bring these up, at the same time while you're doing these testing for the, the, uh, the next G, 5G, future G, um, we're showing how all these things would be able to integrate together. So how do I then take something from uh, the, the RAN, which is providing all these different spectrums for 4G and 5G and the next G, um, how is then integrated with the, the MEC, the edge compute, so that you then see and get that real-time feel at the, at the edge. And then taking that and then how does that then integrate back into the environment so that you can take the data, take the information, and then reuse and refactor these missions to be able to deliver what the, the warfighters are expecting to do to support us. And then how do you then take those learnings and everything and move that out into the field? Because, you know, yes, we're doing a lot of these at the bases here, but we also want to then take this and then, as you heard uh, Mr. Sherman said earlier today, this thing has to go overseas. It's going to have to be able to work and be able to support the mission and the warfighter in those war spaces. So we want to make sure that we're working together with, with um, Dr. Rondone and with the rest of the DOD to, make, to see how do we leverage this network, the power of the network, to bring all these applications and meet the mission outcomes that they're looking for. 
Lamont, it sounds like you're you're kind of hinting at JADC2, or at least what the Department of Defense wants to do with JADC2, and that's that's where I'd like to go with our next line of question, and you know, how 5G or future G, whatever comes next, and when that time comes where JADC2 is needed in an island chain in the Pacific, Western Pacific, um, you know, how is 5G going to play a pivotal role in that, that kind of really cutting edge, forward edge, uh, you know, compute that's needed to make sure that people who are, are, are deploying in those areas have the infrastructure they need to communicate uh, across the in DOD enterprise. Yeah, no, thanks. And what that's doing is it's, it's bringing that edge, that compute closer to that to end user. But what it is, is also recognizing that there are multiple different um, spectrum to be able to support this. There's 5G, there's different bands inside of 5G that you can really work to. You also heard um, uh, Mr. Sherman say this morning about how we're gonna try to leverage the, the 3.17 and, and those spectrum there too as well. We're working together to be able to say, okay, how does all these things integrate and work with these applications? And then we're opening up those APIs from the network and from the compute so that when these developers come, they're able to not, have, not just bring the compute and use the infrastructure and the, the transport, but it's really having that tight coupling of the application to the infrastructure so that you're then able to get the, out, the output that you're looking for. So you take, for example, um, if you're working in the, in the field, you know, Anyone that's fighting a warfighter, flying, flying at any of those F-22s, if you look at that, in any of those pilots, any of the stuff that's on there, there's like at least 40 to 50,000 sensors just in the helmet alone to be able to provide you know, information about what the pilot's going through, what's happening, and the information that they're pulling together. There's a lot of data that comes down that has to come back to the um, command and control centers to be able to support that. What you want to do is be able to get those guys, have that data come in, and then be able to get it out as quickly as you, get them back out in the field as quickly as possibly can with the power of 5G, the power of the mech itself, you're now able to then come in, download that information really quickly, may not even have to come out of flight, there's a lot of testing that's being trying to figure that out, dump that information off so that they can go, go back and do what they need to do in, this, in the war space. So that's where we're gonna be able to see a lot more of that power and the development with what we're doing with the DOD and with the rest of the community. Dr. Rondo, I'm curious about you know your perspective and how the Office of Secretary, Deputy Secretary are sort of tasking you to think about JADC2 with 5G. Yeah, I think one thing we want to make uh, clear when it comes to 5G and, and everything that's going to ba be based off of where we're, we are with this concept of 5G is that it's not just another transport layer. It is that edge computing, it's the local compute, it's computing through the network. So it's not just tying things together, it's actually part of the entire compute fabric. Uh, and so when you think about that and the power that that actually brings to solving problems at, 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 with timeliness and speed, uh, it's, a, it, it's an exciting opportunity for us to, to figure out how to uh, use that and leverage that for our uh, very military applications. Uh, the other aspect of this is, well, there's two aspects I want to get to. One is to, again, keep giving credit to our industry partners uh, because this is, is critical for us to be using these types of commercial technologies today. Uh, all told, to create all, up to 5G and where we are today is over a trillion dollars of investment in research and engineering that, that industry has done. You know, some with DOD uh, you know, work in, uh, through the past, but they've really invested to create this infrastructure that we get to utilize. Uh, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to how to do that, how to safely use it, and how to, how to spin that into to DOD uh, type applications. So being able to operate through, as we call it, existing infrastructure uh, is one of the critical things that, that we want to be able to leverage from this commercial uh, investment. The other one is how do we actually bring our infrastructure to, to the field, right? If there's a bridge, we use the bridge. Uh, if there's no bridge, we build bridges. Uh, similarly, when, when it comes to this type of, of communications infrastructure. Uh, so the other aspects that we're really taking advantage of is the software definedness of this, right? Software defined radio, software defined networking. The fact that these are so much more programmable is really exciting for us as well because every single DUD application uh, is, is a niche application to, to industry. Uh, every time we deploy, the challenges that are, are out there, the dynamics of the field, uh, a building may be there one day and not the next day. Uh, how do you adapt to that? The software-driven nature of this allows us to tune the, the, the technology to those different unique application spaces, uh, unique challenges of, the, of, of our, our, our warfighting uh, concepts, uh, without having to reinvest every time in a whole new data link, a whole new radio system. Uh, it's now software programmable. So that's a really important part of why we're trying to bring this technology in. And I know a major part of this that, that you're passionate about is that open RAN aspect, and I'd, I'd love to dive into that. It kind of, I, I'm sure there's some people out there who don't know exactly what that means, why it's important, and what it affords the DOD and its ability to expand 5G. 
Yeah, and, and you heard the exciting announcement that uh, Mr. Sherman uh, said this morning. Uh, we're really passionate uh, about Open RAN. Uh, I personally am, uh, and the, the department uh, is really um, pushing this. Uh, and it's not just the department. This is the entire U.S. government. Uh, we're working very closely with all of uh, the, uh, our, our interagency partners uh, on Open RAN. What that means is the radio access network. Right? This is a critical component to get information from your phone or your device into the rest of the network. It's, that, it's the middle part between those two those two systems, uh, the base station, basically, right? Uh, right now, as, as was said before, these are black boxes. They're walled off. Uh, they're, they're very uh, uh, controlled, tightly controlled systems, and they're very expensive. Uh, it's, a, it's a significant cost of, of the rollout of, uh, of a new network these days. What we're trying to do with OpenRAN is break open that black box into different components. And that gives us two, uh, or probably more than two, but two that I'll focus on right now. One is it will incentivize new vendors in the market to be able to solve critical problems within that piece. Instead of having to build the entire thing yourself, which is a really hard challenge, uh, many people have tried, many people have failed. But if you just want to, if you have an innovation at one layer of it, a new idea for you know, uh, distributed beam forming, a new idea for you know, a, a radio technology uh, that solves a, a filtering problem or a, a coexistence problem, you don't have to build the entire thing. You get to just focus on that one piece of, your, uh, of the, the full uh, challenge there. Because we've opened it up and we've created well-defined interfaces, which we just heard a lot about that too, uh, so that you can actually move information data across those different uh, uh, components. Uh, that's going to uh, incentivize the market. It's going to incentivize innovation. It's going to change the game of the, of, of the, the speed of innovation in, this, uh, in the 5G and future G world. Uh, and it's going to allow us to explore the internal guts and observe and audit the system so we can even add more security features, zero trust architectures that can, uh, technologies that can fit inside there. All those go together to be an exciting uh, possibility for why this is going to be transformative to, to us and to, to really the industry. Lamont, anything to add from Verizon's perspective on Open RAN? Yeah, no, Dr. Rundown had a, a great but a few points on there. But some of the other things, too, is like we're working very diligently with the DOD, with all the standards bodies, and also other vendors to be able to figure out how do we make to enable us to make this happen. Because it is one of those things that's just critical. I mean, we've started this out on the wireline side. As you guys know, we, there's a lot of stuff talk about software-defined networking, SD-WAN, all those things. How do you then take that into the wireless world? How do you then take that into so you have that full enterprise to be able to move traffic anywhere you need to, be able to segment where you need to, to be able to meet that zero trust aspect? And there's a lot of things that need to be considered and things that we're going to be working on together. We're part of a, diff a bunch of different communities with the National Spectrum Consortium, with the OUSD, to be able to look at this and research how do you you enable this, how do you enable that innovation, but how do you do it also in a secure manner? When we're talking about things that are happening inside of the OCONUS space, we're, we're and in, Co in CONUS too as well, is how do you then use, utilize these existing infrastructures to be able to deliver this, um, but to deliver it safely to, to, to support not only the DOD mission, but also to protect the consumers as well too as well. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, with, but we're gonna work very closely and diligently with to, be, to be able to build these standards out. So we're short on time, but one final question, and you can be as brief as you'd like, but biggest challenge or biggest opportunity you see in this space that's standing in the way or an opportunity to kind of uh, work with industry or vice versa to make this uh, actually an attainable uh, reality? If I may start, uh, the thing that I'm really looking at right now is how do we change the game and how we deal with international uh, challenges, specifically the PRC, uh, and how they like to control markets and how they like to control technology and implementation. If we can change that attitude through these things like openness, create market-based competition, enable innovation, enable security and privacy on these networks, uh, that's a space that they don't, they don't play well in and we play very well in, and that's the great opportunity that we're trying to push towards. A lot of it is really trying to continue this innovation. Um, we're, even though we've been talking about 5G in this for quite a while, there's still a lot of development and work that needs to be done with the, on the application side. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with the, the device ecosystem to make sure that we're able to realize this. There's a lot of things that we've been working to together with the DOD and with other vendors to make sure that we're enabling the, um, all these devices to be able to deliver against the mission set, but to also develop them securely too as well. So it's more, like, more than a challenge, but just continue innovation on that side. Dr. Tom Rondo, Lamont Copeland, thank you both so much for your time. Let's give them a round of applause.